Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Network Capital Writing Fellowship. It's such a pleasure uh, of mine to introduce my friend Shraina, uh, who you all know from a previous masterclass that she taught on Network Capital on public policy and economics. But today we're going to be switching gears and talking about her career as a writer. Um, she's written a fantastic book, which she'll explain a bit about. But through the Writing Fellowship, our mission is to help each of you build your category of one with the power of words. And I think if I look at Shraina's career, she's built her category of one by combining uh, economics, public policy, writing, and as you will come to discover, uh, Bollywood and culture and other kinds of stuff. So today, I mean, I'll consider uh, uh, our class um, to have done its job. If all of you understand how Shraina went about writing this book, what were some of the mental models, practices, uh, etc., cetera, um, buy this book and uh, some of the critical aspects of the book um, as well as the cultural aspects of the book because uh, it does touch upon a wide range of subject and it's not really about um, Bollywood or a particular person it's about a larger trend which I find fascinating so I'm really glad that we're doing this and as we start the network capital writing school in 2022 our goal is to bring to you writers like Shraina who can share what they know and help you scale yourself through the power of words. So thank you, Shraina, for being here. Uh, over to you. Would love to learn more about uh, the entire journey. And then Varya and I will ask you some questions uh, which the audience sent. Thank you for, again for doing this. So, firstly, thanks so much, Utkarsh. It's such a pleasure to be back and just to be back with the Network Capital community. And, and thanks to everyone who's joined. Uh, let me start by just introducing myself. I, I'm Shrayana. I'm currently a senior economist at the World Bank. Uh, in my day job, I, I work on social protection and jobs. And as an example, providing support to state governments and national governments uh, in, in, in India, particularly thinking through safety net social insurance. Uh, so for example, when the COVID pandemic struck, I was leading the bank's engagement on social protection support to India as part of our, uh, it was a, a billion dollar development policy operation. So that's my day job, which is a combination of being a technocrat. Um, I call myself a half economist. I'm not a PhD in economics, but I trained in development economics. Um, and I've learned from that. And, and my job title involves economics heavily, uh, but a more jobbing and practicing economist than an academic one. And along with, of course, being a technocrat and half economist, I'm also a bureaucrat because I work in a large organization and that has its own structures of, of uh, work and, and uh, processes, and I deal with that. And so I think I've been asked many a times, how is it that I ended up writing a book uh, which has something to do with this actor you can see probably behind me in a poster. His name is Mr. Shah Rukh Khan. Uh, I'm a big, massive fan, and I wrote a book. Uh, it's called Desperately Seeking Shah Rukh, India's Lonely Young Women and the Search for Intimacy and Independence. It released about a month ago. Um, and what I want to start by just saying is that the process of writing this book was, it took 15 years. Um, and so this really wasn't a flash of brilliance. This was an extremely rehearsed, uh, long-term product, um, very much a labor of love. And I think uh, uh, it captures the idea of slow literature because it took me a very long time to just pull all the research together. And I'll talk a bit about just the stages and processes that I went through. But to do that, I want to take you back to how this book actually started. Uh, it started in 2006. I was in my early 20s. I had just been trained in, in I'd done a master's in, in development studies, and I'd been trained in economics. And I was very excited, uh, I think I was 23, to essentially go to the field. You know, what, what I think a lot of social scientists and all of us would call the field, to go ask questions, uh, to inform policy. I was extremely excited about collecting data I was a firm believer in the cult of surveys and data and quantitative data in particular. And I started working for a feminist think tank called the Institute of Social Studies Trust. And I've talked about, I think, in much more depth about my work at ISST in the previous uh, masterclass that I'd done, which was much more focused on my career. 
But when I went to work with ISST, one of the first projects that I was assigned to was essentially a research project looking at uh, labor and working conditions of women who were working within the home. Um, this is something that I actually talk about in the book. Large majority of women in India participate in the economy from their home. So they're either making small scale products, uh, they're either providing services from the home. So the home is a very key workplace for most women in the country. And I was part of a project uh, at ISST with uh, one, of in, one of the world's largest labor unions, SEVA, to trace the wages, working conditions of different sectors uh, where women were heavily employed uh, within the home. So I was sent to the slums of Ahmedabad to collect data on women who were making incense sticks at home, agarbattis, and they were paid at peace rates. So you would get around, you know, 10 rupees or 8 rupees, 50 paise per thousand agarbattis that you rolled and gave to a subcontractor. And I was sent with a survey questionnaire to ask a bunch of questions. And when I went to the field, the first thing that I realized, which really surprised me and, and, and in a way I was taken aback, was how incredibly bored uh, many of the women I was supposed to be talking to were um, with my questions. And I, I think it had a lot to do with the fact that they were essentially dealing with their own labor rights and their own wages and economic realities themselves. These were women who were unionizing, fighting with employers, they were every day waking up and contending with extremely harsh realities. They didn't really need um, an expert or a researcher from the outside, uh, essentially a young foolish researcher from the outside coming in and asking them a bunch of these questions. And so they were, they were quite bored. And the one thing I don't want is I don't want anyone to be bored with the questions that I'm asking. And, you know, in research techniques, they teach you, you take a break, um, you know, when things are not really going well in the field. I think all of us are aware of this. And we started taking breaks and started talking about, you know, things that we had in common. And these were women who were obviously very different from me, both in class circumstances, economic circumstances, caste, all kinds of things and attributes. Um, and yet in Bollywood and in film, we found this one topic that we could all mutually talk about and we all enjoyed talking about. And I started asking people about their favorite actors. And I realized in Ahmedabad, I met a bunch of women who absolutely adored actor Shah Rukh Khan. And I absolutely adore actor Shah Rukh Khan. And we started talking about why is it that they liked him. Uh, and immediately I noticed that the energy, the tone, the texture of the conversations just completely opened up. Um, with these women were much more excited, and this is not surprising, this is true for all of us, how is it not true for anyone, that we're much more excited about talking about things that delight us and interest us as opposed to things that depress us. And, and I think in these circumstances, these women wanted to talk to me about songs that they loved, or Mr. Khan's, his persona. And what was fascinating to me was as I paid more and more attention to these conversations, and in the book I described them as research recess, you know, when we take a break from the formal work of research, um, I, I realized that actually when they were talking about Mr. Khan, they were talking about their economic struggles because immediately they started telling me about how difficult it was for women to find cash, to find free time, uh, to find access to media, uh, to just be able to watch a song, watch a film, either on television, let alone the cinema hall. And suddenly I started to realize that this discussion of Mr. Khan was a much more intimate way and a much more accessible way for so many of these women to talk about their economic lives. Because one of the contentions I have in the book is that, you know, we tend to think of fandom just as a it's just a social activity. It's an activity about our tastes and individual preferences. But actually, fandom is also an economic act because to unambiguously follow the work of an actor, to adore the, an actor, to absorb the work of an actor, to understand the work of an actor, or enjoy a film requires free time. It requires time for leisure. It requires liquidity of income. Uh, it requires purchasing power. It requires safe spaces. Uh, you should be able to go out and interact with the market, interact with media. Um, increasingly now, it means you should be able to interact with a mobile phone to, to Google an image of Mr. Khan. And I realized these were all attributes uh, on which there are huge gender gaps in our country. And 
this initial set of conversations in Ahmedabad, which then moved to rural Uttar Pradesh, and you will get a flavor of this in the book, then to the forests of Jharkhand, uh, back to Delhi, made me realize that fandom and these discussions about Mr. Khan were a very refreshing and unusual way to approach the economic lives of women. Um, and I decided to follow up on this story. And many of these women and I, we, we befriended each other in as much as we could. And we talk every time Mr. Khan had a new release. Uh, we talk each time uh, there was a festival season. Um, and usually his releases correlated with festival season because the big Bollywood hits tend to always uh, be released around a big festival, a key festival. And I followed up and, and kept in touch with these women, many of them for more than a decade. So the book has stories about what their lives have been like, their economic struggles to hold on to a job, to find money, to stand on their own two feet, to access public space and just to access fun um, from 2006 till around 2020. And the book covers that period. And sometime in 2013, I did change gears with the book because between 2006 to 2013, while I was following up and diligently keeping notes, I had a draft ready for this book in mind. And the draft was extremely academic. Uh, it was the way I think, you know, traditional research teaches you to write a book. And um, I realized in 2013 when I was dealing with something in my own personal life, and I write about this quite transparently in the book, um, I realized that I didn't want to write this very uh, extremely academic text around the lives of these women because I felt that it wouldn't actually do justice to the stories that I had been, I had the privilege of hearing. And it also, I felt like I was in a stage in my life as well where I wanted the, just the liberty to write in a very different form. And I decided to essentially redo uh, the draft, which was quite painful. And the other decision I made at that point, just listening, you know, reading the notes, all the notes I'd collected from that period of, you know, as I said, 2006 to 2013, was that um, there was such richness and texture to the way I was able to access so many of these lives just because of these conversations about Mr. Khan, because I think people, as I said, people opened up. But I realized it was a very limited narrative because I knew that there were women much like me from different class backgrounds, from the emerging middle class, from elite backgrounds, who all loved him and who were an integral part of his um, huge female fan base. And I was curious to understand how the stories I was hearing from, you know, women in much more difficult economic circumstances, you know, as I mentioned, agarbatti makers, their domestic workers, women who made garments at home, earning just about a quarter of minimum wage in India. How did their way of seeing Mr. Khan, seeing their own lives, their experiences of their love lives, their economic lives, how did that square with women from much more plush and, and privileged circumstances? And I wanted to tell this sort of cross-class story. And I decided in 2013 then to start interviewing women from different class backgrounds. Um, and you'll see that reflected in the book because the book is structured in, in four parts based on where these different women lie on India's economic and wealth distribution, which unsurprisingly also correlates with caste divisions as well. So I start with women like me with a fair amount of privilege. Then there's a section on the emerging middle class, uh, you know, daughters of very conservative trader families who expected these girls to just get married and stay at home. But instead, these women decided to be defiant and hold on to jobs and, and really fight with their families. And the third section goes into the women I met right in the beginning, uh, the agarbatti makers, domestic workers, uh, women making garments and embroidery at home. And what emerged, I think, by around 2017-18 was this, uh, well, I had no social life because there were so many notes and so many interviews to contend with. So I had to pay a tremendous amount of attention to just parsing through what I had discussed and discovered. And I was fortunate at that time, around 2017, I had an excerpt, um, I think it was 2017, an excerpt of the book that was published in, a, in, a, in an Indian magazine called The Indian Quarterly, and this excerpt was called uh, The Aristocrats. And uh, 
somehow that particular excerpt you know did well it was received well and it really boosted my confidence to write in a certain form which was not academic and and i think i threw myself into that experiment um, i i sort of abandoned all the rules of what academia or uh, even my workplace had taught me about how you write and i decided to just write in in a very different form uh, i i wanted to write to give someone comfort not just to educate or illuminate i mean i wanted to educate and inform people on what's happening to women in the labor market that's a very important thread in the book but i also wanted to convey the the loneliness that so many of these women were feeling uh, across class across caste across religion which is actually primarily why they were turning to mr khan when they were feeling very unloved in their real lives I wanted the reader to get a sense that this was a structural loneliness. It was because of the way um, our society and our economy was treating women um, and their desires, and neglecting the way women can perhaps thrive, and supporting those ways. Um, and and so much of that is is found in the statistics that we know, right, about gender gaps. But I felt that often the way in my day job, the way I was writing about statistics and gender gaps, was very soulless. and i understand that because there's this place for different kinds of writing but i really wanted through the book to give people a much more intimate and emotional texture of what feelings and sentiments those statistics tend to hide uh through the stories of the women that i had met and interviewed for nearly 15 years and i then started reshaping the book to make it much more personal and intimate in the way it was written and i i think many people who re- who reviewed the book and read the book are, are, are have have sort of pleasantly reacted to that so that's been that's been wonderful to hear and in 2018 19 i was fortunate to uh, essentially sign up well she calls my, calls herself my agent shruti debi she's not really my agent she's she's more uh, ajan provocateur for the book and very much a guide and i felt like i was in under tutelage with her because i think through the pandemic uh between 2019 20 we really worked on the draft closely together lots of edits lots of rewriting and i'm so blessed because i felt like that really enriched and improved the book and in 2020 it was finally ready and it's now out in 2021 so this is just to give you a sense that this was no i mean i think there are people who are bright and brilliant and talented and then they're able to write books in a very short period of time based on information that they have but i i think for me it was a slow long process of long conversations following up on the lives of of multiple women and i'm very grateful to the iconography of mr khan because i think he allowed for that for this kind of community to emerge uh which was really important i think in writing the book um and so it's been a 15 year writing process um and i'm quite certain that my next will also take a significant amount of time because i think emerging out of this i've grown to really appreciate uh, i think what sociologists tend to call longitudinal work right so you keep following up in time with the same people um and and you abandon this hubris that if you've met somebody once and you've interviewed them once you can really enter and write about their lives unless it's it's a very different kind of text um and i'm sure there's value to that but i find that for, for the kind of person i am with the limited confidence i have often also as a person i think it's important for me to just constantly interact with people uh, before i start to think about writing about them um or even claim the confidence to write or make claims about what they're telling me um and so i i i do want to sort of leave you with that which is this was a long process and a long a book which was a long time in the making um you know one of the things i i understood from utkarsh and varya is i think there were questions about well what are the key themes of the book Uh, to me the book is essentially i think i discovered from a historian manu pillai that the book he calls the book an intimate history of of indian women um, and i think that's a really beautiful description because in a way if you look at the stories in the book there's it's a very personal telling of what the economy and indian society has felt like and felt is the emphasis um, you know it really felt like for a very diverse group of women between the period of liberalization into the current well the recent lockdown and two things that really emerge one is that the economic lives of women just continue to be neglected and misunderstood so as i mentioned the fact that the home is a workplace uh, the kinds of investments you need to make for women to feel comfortable working 
Um, and I think the second is, you know, a lot of economists of late talk about what, what they call hidden taxes. And the idea is that when people start to behave uh, in ways that don't conform to social scripts, um, often societies, communities, or just in, in our interpersonal lives, in our love affairs, in our marriages, in our conversations with sisters and brothers, our intimate interpersonal lives, we start taxing people for not behaving the way we would like them to. And in the book, I think you you get a flavor of a very large set of stories of women who choose to hold on to a job, which we should remember in India is working women remain a meager, meager statistical minority in India. Uh, we've had sharp drops at female employment um, since 2004, 2005. It's stabilized a bit recently, but there are huge gender gaps, particularly after the pandemic as well. And um, one of the things that I was very keen to try and capture is that so many of these women, if they wanted to hold on to a job, if they wanted to cultivate a professional identity for themselves, other than being wives and mothers, uh, society and their, their, their loved ones really taxed them for it. They made them feel unworthy. They made them feel unloved. And there was a lot of loneliness that I was picking up when I was talking to these women simply because they wanted to earn their own money and, and they chose how to spend it. Um, and, 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 I, and I think the book gives you a, a textured feel of what the economic lives of women and the trade-offs and bargains that women have to make um, if they want to cultivate identities beyond just the traditional motherhood and marriage and, and caregiving. The second theme that was very important to me, and I'll, I'll close on this, is that, you know, we, we tend to think that our love lives have nothing to do with our economic lives. So, you know, there's a serious book that I could write, right, which would just be sort of a bunch of stuffy numbers and a bunch of theories on, on, on women in the economy. But I think all feminist economists and feminists know that love, care, our social relationships are the economy. The economy is a set of relationships. It's not just soulless transactions between people. And I think in writing the book, that was something I was very conscious of, which is I didn't want the reader to feel daunted by the statistics. Um, and I didn't want the reader to feel as if they were drowning in information because there's a lot, there are almost 60 pages of references in the book and there's a lot of data in there. Um, but I wanted the reader to understand and enter the data but in a much more accessible way through the stories and, and, and really understand the sentiment that, as I said, the statistics hold. That was very important to me, I think, as a project and just thinking through what I was trying to do. Um, and, you know, if there was a talisman I had, I think it was that was the talisman, which is that, you know, if if someone who is absolutely not versed in, in development economics, it doesn't work in public policy, has nothing to do with journalism, uh, if they picked up the book, uh, would they be able to enter the lives of women and understand the data without feeling exhausted by it? And that was very important to me. And, and I think that required a certain amount of lightness of touch, which I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, I think, as more people will read, they'll react to. Um, so so let, me, let me stop there. I, I think I've tried to outline just you know, my own history, the history of the book, and some key themes. And I'm excited and happy to answer any questions. Utkarsh. Yeah, it's fascinating, Shaira. It's, um, it's been a delight, obviously, uh, seeing you write this book. I want to take you back the memory lane um, to Davos. So one of the years I was there, uh, Shah Rukh Khan was also visiting, and I just got a message mm -hmm. from you saying that you know, is uh, uh, I'm writing a book. Uh, can you let it be known that you know this is this is uh, this is work in progress? And I did try. It's just that you know when Shah Rukh Khan walked in into that particular hotel, he was just surrounded. So much security authority that all we could do. and I um, I considered shouting but I thought that maybe that I'll, like I'll be thrown out or something but you know I think now he I'm pretty sure he's uh, gotten to know that this book uh, exists if not uh, we can now help uh, you know through network capital in taking the book to <laughs> at least we'll do our best Thank you Utkarsh. but you know I, I have to I have to say one thing before you go into your question on this which is um, I I do have to say that uh, I had never imagined in my wildest dreams. I, I think, you know, you don't realize when the book is out there 
suddenly now i think the expectation is you know people keep asking me you know is he aware of it has he reacted um mm. inshallah at some point but i also think the book came out at a very difficult time for the actor in, in just his mm. own career and filmography so hopefully i'm i'm looking forward to either through you i i'm trying every way possible uh, including my publishers to make sure that his team is aware and as i said inshallah hopefully uh, one will yeah. hear something at some point yeah does the commercial success of the book surprise you uh so i'll know the extent of it soon enough but i i must i must confess that uh i had expected the book to do well with women readers of i think certainly of a certain milieu because you know i think the reading public as we know it's sort of very fragmented right um what has surprised me is the is the younger women i had expected a lot of women essentially in the late 30s i think women who sort of seen that world of pre liberalization have grown with sharof in a way uh, born in sort of the late 1980s to really pick it up but what has really surprised me is is i find a lot of young women have been writing to me and have been reading the book and picking up the book and recommending the book which is wonderful because that also because this is a generation that hasn't necessarily grown up with mr khan the way i think my generation has uh, you know i i think there's a there is a difference there mm -hmm. um and i think what what has i think what that's been a pleasant surprise because i think what that's meant utkarsh is that clearly the book and this was the hope with the book that the stories of the women in a way transcend just mr khan because i know so many yeah. people have been picking it up and reading it and as you yourself said mm -hmm. i think right in the beginning and very well i thought which is the book is not about mr khan it uses mr khan's iconography as a lens to talk about the lives of women who love him right but hmm. but actually the book is much more about what has been the experience of women i think in india over this past 20 year period hmm. 30 year period while he also happens to have been ruling bollywood as well um right. and and i think that that combination worked and i'm surprised what i had expected was the combination to work for people who really know his filmography very well and who who mm. followed him i think what has been a pleasant and wonderful surprise i have to say is is people who don't necessarily um they may not be his biggest fans but and younger women who may not have sort of grown up loving him as much as mm. i think so many of us have they've really picked it up and and they've really i think taken to it so that's been really wonderful yeah you talk to us about how this idea came to you and how you started writing and it it's a 15 year project as you as yeah. you walked us through talk us through the highs and lows because uh, i'm pretty sure it wasn't a straight journey i'm pretty sure uh, there yeah. were challenges in writing um talk to us about yeah. that yeah uh utkarsh i i actually i have to confess and i have to start by saying that the pandemic was a very difficult time to be editing and rewriting anything right i mean it was just such a terrible time for everyone um right. i okay. lost people i mean people were sick in the family i had covid like a bunch of things right all mm. of that happened and now when i look back i think it's just sheer force of will and perhaps i i am not a big believer in 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 you know sort of destiny but but sometimes maybe i think it it was an act of something that's perhaps larger than oneself or perhaps it was the wonderful shruti devi who's you know as i said my agent and very much you know i think guide for this book because she really pushed me and made sure you know that 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 we were accountable to timelines and we did what we needed to do i think the pandemic was the hardest i i i think that just has to be very i think it must be hard for anyone to just do a, just anything creative right given what we were all dealing with yes there was time <clears throat> but my job as you well know utkarsh was actually extremely hectic and i write about this in the book it was extremely yep. hectic and quite crazy in the early part of the pandemic because i was part of the bank's team responding to the crisis um i i, I was i was leading the dialogue with the ministry of finance so it was a very difficult time just professionally and then switching gears to writing hmm. so i think the pandemic was very difficult um i want to start hmm. with that i think the other part that was really difficult was when i decided instinctively because with kashan 2013 there was potentially a, a a very niche feminist publishing house that had come out and said that well we would like to publish that very the somewhat academic version of the book which was only focused on a, a smaller set of lives and i had a draft and then you know the easiest thing to do then is to just say yes you know this is wonderful and it was a great publishing house i mean i you know i was super excited but i somehow you know when you listen to yourself and your gut tells you that there's a different direction for what you're trying to do to then lean into what 
your own instincts are saying sometimes can be very difficult because you know you just you know you're young i mean i was still in my sort of late 20s early 30s at that point and i just wanted to be published and i'd been working yeah. on this so hard and you know people keep asking you right like oh when is your book coming out because a lot of people had known that i was doing research for the book hmm. um so the easiest thing the temptation was to just say yes you know to hell with it let's just you know sign off and finish but something utkarsh i i don't know you know if it's a creative instinct the fact that it just didn't feel right i i realized mm. no i wanted to work on this more and mm. that was i think probably following the pandemic the real low because then you you've decided of your own volition mm. you're going mm. to take more time and and then you mm. know you sort of ask yourself is the time worth it you know is the number of rewrites worth it and the one thing i can say utkarsh to anyone listening to this right now rewrite 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 take your time don't be i know we live in a culture which really rewards you know immediate quick delivery mm. and create a quick creative product if you have the luxury and the privilege to take time which i think some of us do you know we have separate mm. jobs this is a hobby it's a passion project take your time to do it because mm. you know you will never regret the and i don't mean it to like for it to be perfect nothing is ever perfect but i mm. think you will know in your own body uh, it sounds quite lofty and and strange for me to say this but i really do believe this i think you will know when it's time to stop um but take your time to to, to do yeah. justice to what you're trying to do and i felt in 2013 mm. the draft that i had just did not do justice to what i think the ambition was with this book um and i think the other low for me was you know realizing that uh, and it's a, it's a silly low but but it's 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 there which is that you know many a times people would sort of look at me and say but why are you writing a silly book about an actor i mean you're more hmm. serious than this right like you you hmm. there's this hmm. sort of seriousness olympics and then you know you try and explain it to them and then before and this was before the book had come out right and so you get you get some strange judgment from people because they're like well what kind of unserious book is this uh, how is this why are you writing this and why are you doing this and so there'll always be people who will doubt you know the project and so on and so forth so you know that's a more traditional low which is a more internal low so i think those were the lows and then the highs were just honestly just the research i miss it right now i mean i'm willing to just throw myself back into i don't know just uh, i have an idea for what i want to do next and i just want to throw myself into it because i loved the conversations i loved just the the feel of that the texture of that i think i really miss it um i loved just sitting and reading stacks and stacks of notes and looking at the data so i'm really missing the joy of just that part of the creative work i mean now it's a very different stage the book's mm. life is in right now and so that was the real high for me and the ultimate high for me was when um i i have to confess when professor banerji uh, offered the blurb for the book which i mean is yeah. a, i i i will not i will not lie i was quite moved uh, quite emotional at that point because you know i mean i come from a very traditional bengali family and the idea that you know probably now like the the pride of bengal has said these really kind things about the book i just mm. it took me some time to just for that to sink in right. um and then i i think that was those were i think the blurbs the process of that was quite is quite rewarding because till then you don't really know how people are reading it right um, mm. and, and i think that's that's important to hear Um, yeah. and the ultimate high i think and i'll close on this since i give you three lows the ultimate high was when shruti my agent guide said we're done you know <laughs> this is this, the book is done <laughs> right. because you know she's she's extremely meticulous i mean you know there were like notes and all kinds of things that and i thought oh god you know like she she's like a phd i mean i really felt like i was in the middle of some kind of phd advisor session with her Uh, so when she said to me we're done that was an ultimate high because i realized at that point that i was actually we were done you we were done yeah talk to me about professor banerji um getting the blurb is not such a straightforward process uh, one has to really ask the right set of people they 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 ideally want to go through it talk to us about the process and talk to us about the stuff that he told you but is not written um ah <laughs> well yeah that well you know the the a couple of things i actually know professor banerji because of the book uh because right in the really? long time ago i thought yeah, he yeah, told you something 
no actually he's never no no i've never been taught by him uh, i was introduced okay. to him through uh, my very dear friend who's a fabulous economist clamor imber uh, who's who's worked with professor banerji they've written papers right. on narega together and i was introduced to him at a conference um, and i mentioned some work that i was doing I, at that point on the right to public services and also the book and very early on i you know i took a chance and i think this is the chance that again i encourage everyone to take and i know this is the kind of advice and guidance i know all, you've really been championing with the network capital community which is put yourself out there i mean if you know someone thinks you're stupid they'll tell you you're stupid but at least you tried right and yeah. and it sounds really banal but i think it's really important so i took the chance of just sending some stuff to him knowing fully well that you know it might just drown in his inbox um hmm. but fortunately it didn't and then mm-hmm. i think from there when the excerpt from the book came out the aristocrats he really he really enjoyed it and i think he's a connoisseur of thinking about how the economy structures the way we think about society right and i think mm-hmm. that's sort of an interaction in the book um and after that i sent him the draft when the book felt it was ready and i did send it to mm-hmm. him a bit earlier than uh, just to make sure that you know he had enough time and honestly i think it was just it was sheer i think it was a it took a period of time because i mean i think he was aware of my work in the past and then i think from that one was able to sort of build and 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 write and say could you consider um and as for the things that he said about the book that are not in the blurb actually uh, almost everything he said about the book it's a long blurb so it's right there um i think um one piece of advice and you know i've really been influenced a lot by his own work right uh, because there was work that you know that poor economics to me i think is just is an economics masterpiece i mean i it's it's kind of silly for me even to say that i think everybody knows that uh, but I, what i really enjoyed about the book is uh, of course there's all the theory and all of that but i think there was something very personal about the way the stories are told um mm. i i think both professor banerjee and professor duflo make these people come alive and i think that's really important and you know in economics you're not usually encouraged to do that right in fact you're supposed to sort of hide behind the numbers and the mm. the models and the statistics and the econometrics and all of that uh but what i really took away from actually his own writing if you look at his academic papers as well as the book in particular is that is a very personal telling of of these very rigorous studies but they're told in a much more accessible way and i think i took a leaf from that because i really felt that you know there are two economists i mean the other economist who i absolutely admire so much and i think everyone should read uh, uh, jhola wala economics is jean dres's book it's an edited volume yeah. of his essay um I, you know one of the things he says in the introduction for his book is he says that it is our responsibility especially those who work in things that can be very esoteric and sort of you know remove from people to be honest mm. to put people at the center of all the research that we're trying to do so it has to be ethical there has to be integrity and it has to be accessible and i think that to me from both professor banerjee's work from professor dress dress's work he's interviewed in the book um mm. and you know that was i think Uh, for me that was very important uh, that it, you can't you know don't play the as i mentioned earlier do, you don't need to do the seriousness olympics like i you don't have to sort of prove to people how much econometrics you know or how much jargon you know just so that you know you can sort of signal something about your academic status hmm. uh, in fact the more easier it is for someone who is absolutely cut off from what you do to pick it up and to absorb it i think the more important right. it is and i think to me that is i felt that there were a lot of books that i was encountering and papers i was encountering with kars on gender and the economy but i felt like there was i hadn't yet read something that brought it all together in a way that will still make you smile cry laugh like you'll feel something when you read these papers and statistics and surveys and studies and that's actually what i wanted to do because i felt like that when i read poor economics you know it had moved me so i i wanted to sort of draw a leaf from there awesome no thanks shaina um you know network capital is more than 50% women a, a dash over 50% yeah. and uh, many of them are not from india or haven't lived in india so one question that we kept getting when we announced your session mm-hmm. was uh, what is the female gaze and how has the female gaze evolved over a period of time in india that's a great question um i i think if you look at the stories in the book and i'll stick to that and i'll stick to all the yeah. citations and surveys in the book 
um, two things you realize. One is, you know, I, I, I happen to, because I followed a bunch of women who were born perhaps in their early 80s, given the fertility of India, the way the fertility rates work and the age of, you know, the first child being born, many of these women actually had kids and I followed their kids as well through the book. Many of them were daughters. And the thing that I notice intergenerationally that has changed um, when we think about the female gaze, I mean, it's the female gaze towards men in particular and the female gaze towards opportunity. And by opportunity, I mean opportunity to just be independent, go to a mall, uh, have your own mobile phone, opportunity to just access and taste the world outside just your home. Because the one thing that's true for most Indian women, and I think this is true for most of South Asia, is that the home is where women are supposed to be. And that is where your social life, your economic life, your productive life, all of it is supposed to essentially be circumferenced around that by the home and the family. And, and I think the change that I try to etch in the book is that while the older generation of women accept this role and then they try and bargain to find more freedom within it, right? So they'll they'll bargain that I'll work extra hours doing this if you let me do that, right? There's this like yeah. bargaining going on with like husbands, with your in-laws, with your mom-in-law, with all kinds of things. I'll marry a man I'm not really attracted to, but then I then want to be left alone, right? Like there are, there are, there are, there are things that people will, different kinds of bargains that people make. I'll take a job, but I'll work extra hours to make sure the kids do their homework, right? Like these are, right. so you accept that your role is still the primary care provider for the home and the gaze towards opportunity then is essentially mediated through these bargains. Younger women, I found, are just unwilling to bargain. They, 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 you know, I actually say this in the book as, and, and I think it mirrors with the way women see Mr. Khan because the older generation of women, they admire him as this benevolent patriarch, right? So this is a guy who like care for you. He'll make sure you have like enough income. Uh, he, he'll make sure you have a comfortable life. And if you want to do something and you ask him permission, but you have to ask him permission, he'll give it to you. You know, he'll be, he'll be supportive, right? Whereas the younger women, they were not interested in him as an idea of the benevolent patriarch. They wanted to be him. They wanted, you know, mm. his success, his star power, his ability to just access whatever he wants to. Um, and I see this shift. So I think the female gaze, there's one which is heavily mediated through the lens of care, through reproductive labor, which I notice that older women were much more willing to conform to social scripts. They were still agentic beings, so they were still bargaining and they were trying to find their own spaces of freedom through a very complex set of bargains, which you can see in the book. But younger women were just unwilling to even consider, mm. you know, I, to them, you know, freedom. And, and one of the one of the beautiful examples of this is in the book. Um, one of the women I follow, this is the first woman actually I met who was a Shah Rukh fan. She um, essentially in 2006 had a daughter who was 10 years old and now obviously is a grown woman, her <coughs> daughter. And, you know, the, they both loved Dil To Pagal Hai, which is a fantastic Shah Rukh film. I encourage everyone who doesn't know his films to go watch it. Uh, it's this soppy love story. And, and at the end of the film, Utkarsh, there's a line that appears, which is in English. OK, and I, and I think it says something like, come fall in love. No, not come fall in love is DDLJ. It says everybody needs to love. One of these sort of, you know, this idea that yeah. love is, a, you know, is, a, is something that you should aspire to. Um, and I write about it in the book. And, you know, the mother didn't read English, so she didn't understand what it meant, but she loved the songs, but she would always say the songs are just dreams, right? They're just escape from extremely romantically impoverished lives. Um, but for the daughter, she would say, how would you marry without love? She could read English. She read it and she believes in the sort of power of finding your own mate, no bargains. And she's still unmarried. And, and you know, there's a story about her and her mother in the book, which I'd encourage people to read. Hmm. And so I think that's one big shift, right? The, the, the gaze towards opportunity and your willingness and appetite to bargain or not to bargain. Um, I think the second is the female gaze, of course, towards men. And I think here, again, as I mentioned with the Sharuk case, my sense is that there is a shift from men as just breadwinners towards now men being partners and equal supporters of your own ambition. And, and I think a lot of the frustrations that are captured in the book are, while women's <clears throat> aspirations of men have really evolved, 
um, I think men's ability to adapt and to serve and sort of, you know, support those ambitions are still limited because there are some very conventional scripts of masculinity that seem to prohibit that. So time and time again, Utkarsh, I would hear from younger women um, or even women my age um, who are elite, upper middle class, English speaking, you know, women, they would say, well, you know, men want us to quit jobs. Immediately marriage and motherhood will push you out of uh, any kind of career that you may have. Men don't want to marry women who are as successful as them, right? So there are all these questions about feeling taxed for being professionally, you know, doing well. And I think there's a shift in the gaze of what you expect men to do, right? Um, and I think in the book, these are sort of two or three areas where I think the female gaze is exposed. And I think the biggest way the book, I think, really tackles the female gaze is the female gaze towards the economy. Because I think there's a traditional way men write about the economy, which is sort of, you know, a bunch of sort of usually numbers and a lot of good advice about, you know, government should do X and government should do Y. And that's all very useful literature. But I, but feminists would write about the economy keeping love, care, families, as I said, social relationships as the heart of the economy, recognizing that those actually determine who can work, who is productive, what wages you earn, how many hours you can work. And I think when you put a place a female lens to the economy, the economy looks very different. And I think the book is essentially an effort to that, to, to, to at least give you a sense of when women start to look at the economy, what does the economy look like? Um, and I'm very grateful again to Mr. Khan because I think his icon allowed for those conversations to surface because I think without that, if I'd just gone in and asked a bunch of questions, I think people would yeah. just not react to the yeah. way the way they did. Yeah. In your research, did you discover that uh, Indian women um, are romantically impoverished even today? And how is romantic impoverishment evolved, if at all, in the past uh, say three decades that you've studied? Yeah. You know, Utkarsh, I, the answers are a bit disappointing. I think you know the latest Pew survey as well, right? There was a Pew yeah. survey on social attitudes that came out, in fact, right in the middle of the pandemic. And it essentially tells us that women still marry based on familial permission, preference, right? Majority, it's only about 5% of women as per the last IHDS data who choose their own partners exclusively. That's just shocking, right? I mean, we should all just yeah. be shocked. We should be on the streets protesting this, but we don't. Um, and I, I sense that there's a big amount of change that's happened between people like you and me. I mean, our class of Indians, sort of, you know, upper... The, the sort of upper class of India, there is a shift. But I would argue that given the way the labor market is, where and also the way social spaces are organized, women are still heavily dependent on men. And what I mean by that is, even for me, I work for the World Bank, for me to find a house on my own in an extremely plush neighborhood in Delhi is really hard. It's not easy. People don't want to rent to single women. There are all kinds of taboos and social ideas about what could go wrong. Um, you get a lot of judgment from society in general. And the my wage compared to typically men who might be doing what I'm doing, which is not true for the World Bank, but it's true often for the private sector, men earn more as well because they usually negotiate for higher wages or you know there are issues around salary and salary scale and structures. And I think given the fact that the economy and public space and the way investments in public space are organized are so heavily making women dependent on men for security and survival, to be perfectly honest, um, not to mention status in some cases, because, you know, being married is seen as conforming to a certain way of being and all of that. Everyone, all women I know are obsessed, you know, marriage, the tyranny of marriage is something that I think women are yet to escape from. I would argue this is true for men as well, but I think much more true <clears> for women. And I think given that what's happened is, you know, we, we, we use that term settling, right? So, so many women would say to me that I'm settling because I can't be not married. I have to find someone. And even if it's, you know, and there are stories about this, you know, there's a story about a Rajput woman who comes from a very plush family in the book. Um, she really does not have a loving marriage, but she married, married this man because she needs the stability. She needs the financial security for her family. If she decides to leave him, where will she go on her own? There are, you know, there is tremendous threat and it's really not particularly safe for most women. Um, and I think given that the romantic impoverishment for elite women is a bit different because what it means is that while on the surface, I think, you know, we seem very modern, but unless these terms of dependence don't start changing and you'll get a flavor of this in the book, 
I think it's going to be very difficult. But there is this, there are stories in the book about women who choose to be single. I'm one of them. I mean, I'd rather be on my own than settle for someone I don't love as an equal uh, and who doesn't see me as an equal. Um, and time and time again, I found lots of women who really struggle to find that. I, I, not that I'm saying that they don't, but that still remains a struggle. And I don't think men struggle as much in the mating market, I think, as much as women do because of these scripts about aging, body, hmm. safety. Will you be able to take care of yourself? I think there are these concerns. Men can take care of themselves. It's fine. You can be on your own. You can play the field. There will be no judgment. It's perfectly fine. So that's, I think, elite and upper middle class women. Utkash, I think when it comes to working class women and, you know, sort of, you know, low income women in the book, I think there the romantic impoverishment is a bit different. Um, often there, you know, marriage is sort of just something you do, right? Like it's it's a it's a rite of passage. You must get married by a certain age uh, to ensure that you have access to some amount of land, you know, assets, so on and so forth. But actually, in these communities, I saw increasingly uh, a greater taste to, for for romantic freedom. And and in fact, the in the book you'll find this, which is that. Um, women constantly would say, well, why can't these men be more like Shah Rukh? And And I think what they're <laughs> saying, they're actually complaining about the men in their lives for being not particularly emotionally available, um, for drinking. There's a lot of that in the book, that the questions and concerns about violence, uh, you know, physical abuse, emotional abuse, different kinds of things. And And there's a feeling that there is this kinder, gentler man that seems to be missing. And, and, and I found that actually it's amongst women from very harsh economic circumstances, since they're finding more economic power, because since liberalization, many of these women had to step out in some cases and work outside the home because the house needed to survive. Many of them also are married to men who were in jobs that no longer pay as much. So in Ahmedabad, for example, factory-based labor lost a bunch of jobs. These were men working in textile factories. And then women had to step in to do ad hoc jobs to make money. And as these women have more economic voice, they're also able to voice expectations of the way they want the men in their lives to behave, be it helping them at the home, uh, the way they dress, the way they behave, the way they act, the freedom with which they're also willing to critique these men. And I think that was very interesting to me, uh, that while I think they are very much tied to the arranged marriage market, they are now increasingly using and leveraging their economic power and new communities that they find because of their jobs to abandon marriages that don't work for them. So one of the principal characters in the book is a woman who uh, lives in, as I mentioned, the slum of Ahmedabad. She left her husband. She, she's, she decided to go out on her own, which is a very difficult uh, task to, uh, to encounter and to take on. But she did it relying on communities she created through work. Because, you know, we think of jobs and the economy, and I think this is what I wanted to really highlight, which is that we think of jobs and the economy as just money. It's not money. It's actually an identity. It's a set of networks, right? You, you, you meet new people at work. You know this. I mean, Network Capital certainly knows this. You know, work is more than just earning an income. Work is so many other things. You know, if you feel unloved in your house, you'll feel loved and meaningful at your job, perhaps. You'll meet new people. And I think what these women were doing was through work, particularly working class women, through work, they <coughs> met new people and new communities. And they were able to use them to leave marriages that were not making them happy. And this woman who left her husband, her daughter refuses to settle. I mean, she's not going to marry someone who she does not love. Um, and so I, I think it's interesting how it's playing out very differently in, in different classes. Um, I, I think this, this notion of romantic impoverishment. I, I won't say that women are romantically impoverished across class, because I think that's a very um, heavy handed statement to make. But I do think that there is a feeling that the social dice when it comes to love is really loaded in men's favor uh, because of, as I mentioned, because of public space, because the social sanc sanction for men to explore multiple relationships, uh, whereas women, you know, there's also concerns about the body and reproductive health. I think given all of that, um, there was this feeling that men just have it better right now. It's, it's, it's a men's market. I think that's, I think, largely what I really picked up. And I don't think that's changed dramatically. I think that's changing amongst working class women as they start to assert gr greater economic independence. Right. Um, while writing this book, I'm sure you stumble into men or discuss this um, with uh, you know male colleagues, friends, and uh, people you researched. Um, did you encounter resentment or a, a slight grudge of the evolution of the female gaze that women yeah. are now 
asserting themselves a bit more economically and are there they know what they want uh, and so forth but that's is, a, is it clear yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Am yeah, I yeah. making sense? Okay. You are absolutely yeah. making sense, and that's such a. I think that's such an important question, uh, Utkarsh, because to me, I really think that now the conversation around gender, the onus of it, is a much more. We need to have a much healthier conversation about masculinity because everywhere I went, and I think with Sharoh, it sort of comes out because I, I, I write about this, which is everywhere I went, and I met women who loved him. I met. men who berated him and berated the women for loving him because i think somewhere they knew subconsciously that these women were giving voice to a kind of masculinity that these men were not holding exhibiting i think there is a wounded masculinity i think you're absolutely right i think that as more and more women start to expect much more from men expect much more from society it's making a lot of men particularly i think upper caste men who are used to a certain amount of privilege in the way families work feel very uncomfortable because they they feel like they're losing their grip right you're losing some sense of control and power um so yes and in the book in fact i have a i have a whole set of chapters uh, which are about elite and upper class women and i think this resentment really plays out very strongly there um which is that there is this feeling that you're asking for too much and you should be happy with what i'm doing uh, and yet there is no real change in male behavior because if you look over the period of years men's support to housework still remains really limited right and even if a woman is working she's still bearing the burden of that um, i think men stepping into the kitchen is yet to happen at, at scale in india at all even amongst upper classes um and so i think the way to handle some of the resentment that they see with these new kinds of women who are much more confident much more empowered is then to tax them in the mating market right so these are those hidden taxes that i was talking about so constantly women would tell me that uh, men would lecture me on my career and how i should leave it because it's really not meaningful you're not you know there's a lot of patronizing nonsense that goes on you know in these kinds of dynamics and i you know i did meet women who found very supportive partners and and not to say that they didn't but that was a minority and i think we should acknowledge that the fact that you're even asking me this question right i think it's important to have this conversation but i i still think we're in a minority having this conversation still um and so i did pick up resentment resentment amongst people from different class backgrounds is a bit different because there i think the resentment is it just plays out as violence like uh, not there's violence in these upper class homes and i think particularly in a story about this rajput woman i talked about she's really had to navigate it and encounter it in her own way and the stories in the book um but i think amongst working class men and women the sense i had was that either i didn't have access to discussions about male resentment as much but the sense i had was because so much of this work that women were doing and the money they were earning was couched in oh this is good for the family right because mm-hmm. it was couched in that language the resentment was somewhat <clears throat> better managed it's there it's simmering it 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 boils up as violence um but i didn't you know the kinds of taxes that one sees in 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 sort of environments that are supposed to be really modern and liberal you didn't see that in in these other marriages and the way these relationships worked out but i do think we have a crisis of very wounded insecure men uh, who really i don't think have adapted to this new world of very confident women um and and i think that's sort of really the call i think of our generation when it comes to gender which is i think a healthier conversation around masculinity got it uh, this is so well explained and i think this point will people should discuss this in their own households and their circles we certainly will uh, on nc Tell us, Shraina, writing this book, have you changed your mind about something? Like every author has yeah. a thesis that he or she wants to validate. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, I, I, in fact, two things. And and firstly, I, I really, I mean, I think life should be Bayesian. You should always be updating your beliefs. <laughs> I mean, that's something that I think. If you don't do that, you're just sort of stuck. And I think that's just the worst, most boring kind of person. And who would want to be that person? Um, I. two things when i went into writing the book i really did believe that my class of women were much more empowered much more you know we just had i really believe that we were fighting against gender constraints much more than i thought women from more harsh economic circumstances were i think at the end of this book i can't claim that anymore um i i actually think that 
in some cases i actually believe that the kind of internalized misogyny that women have towards women in my class of women is actually i think much more problematic than even perhaps uh women from very different class backgrounds so i think that's really something that i've shifted and i think the other thing that really shifted for me which will sound a bit odd is that you know you're taught in social science always to think about like an us and a them right so there are like poor women and then there's like wealthy women and then there's upper caste you know dalit women there are all these divisions of identity that you're always taught to be very cognizant of and they're important because of course these you know they they mediate welfare outcomes nutrition outcomes all of that and i think this is not to dispute any of that but you know talking to these women about someone who we could all talk about right and in 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 mr khan i realized that actually the shape of love loneliness um feeling a bit short changed in life i think those are universal feelings utkarsh and i i think we are united in them i i think we spend too much time and especially when i had gone into this book i really adhered to these distinctions because you know you must adhere to these distinctions and again i'm not disputing that they are not important but what i'm trying to say is i think we need to find much more in the sense of our emotional experiences and the way we see men the way we see relationships the way we even see jobs sometimes there's so much that actually unites and is common amongst women across classes and i think i'm really again grateful to mr khan's iconography because he in a way encapsulates that right that each one of us mm. comes from you know i may watch him on my fancy iphone and another woman is struggling to watch him she barely has the money to like watch him on anything mm. and yet when we watch him we see him sometimes with the same pair of eyes but but we can all relate to him in these different ways right and and i think to me that's one thing i've really updated which is that i don't want to just talk about what divides us but i'd rather focus on what unites us because i think there is a lot that unites us across these divisions um sure. and i think that's something that really changed i think shifted in me awesome any parting advice for uh, an author trying to attempt a really complex multi-layered topic um, how should they maintain their motivation how do they find a, like um a great editing schedule writing schedule any parting advice although you've touched upon some of it yeah i so a couple of things i i think firstly i'm a big believe, your first draft no matter how brilliant you are your first draft is not is not is it's not going to be your last draft just just i i know lots of people you will have to rewrite and you need to make be psychologically prepared for that um and i think in terms of scheduling i mean for me i used to keep almost an hour every day even if i didn't do anything anything productive um just to, even if it's just to read notes just just keep that time aside i think then you know you honor it once it's sort of in your schedule and you can sort of stick to it and then sometimes you'll surprise yourself by being really really productive and you know whatever the third piece of advice i would give is i had shruti as you know my agent and and really my best reader followed by my editor shogat das gupta I think find a reader, find someone who will read, uh, read well, read closely. Um, will give you feedback. Um, it could be an agent if you want to find one, and I highly recommend that route. But if that's not the route you want to go through, you know, it could be a professor, could be someone in the family. I mean, could be a boyfriend, girlfriend, whoever. You know, find someone who is. I'll maybe not boyfriend girlfriend but someone who's a bit dis distant and then can give you some feedback and perspective because I I really think with me for instance with this as you just said it was so complex so many notes I remember one Shruti actually told me she said I can see that you know you're blind sometimes to the material because you're almost you know you're just seeped in it right and then you mm. can't see it you can't see it sometimes so you need someone who can just see it from the outside for you a little bit um so I I would suggest find a reader who can consistently give you feedback i think that's really important second block some time it sounds really banal but time keeping and scheduling really helps just psychologically right just to give yourself markers that you have to do it um and the third is be psychologically prepared to just it will take longer than you think i mean there is no timeline i i know all of us believe that there's a deadline and i'll finish it by then maybe you'll finish a draft by then but it will take longer and be psychologically prepared for that i think that will be important and of course the final piece of advice which i know is so trite but every writer gives this to read 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 anything and everything i think reading makes the best writing 
um, I would not have been able to write the book that I did had it not been for the women I was reading in particular. And so I'm a very big, you know, I, I think this is, again, as I said, it's really trite to say, but it's important to say it, which is read. Yeah. This has been fascinating, Shraina. Um, congratulations uh, a ton for making this book into a bestseller. And, uh, you know, we, we actually plan to now have a few offline meetups to discuss such oh. an important topic that you've uh, touched upon. I know uh, we're doing this now virtually, but uh, as you begin to travel or, um, you know, in Delhi, London, perhaps, we should do a lot of these offline discussions um, because this, what you've written and what you've talked about um, is merits discussion and reflection of society. Thank you, Utkarsh. I'll be thrilled. We should do a Network Capital Book Club meeting somewhere in yeah. Delhi, London, wherever. Happy to. And as always, yeah. it's a pleasure talking to you and, and just to your community. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me. This was this was so great. And you asked me so many wonderful questions that really made me sort of go back in time and just think through the whole process. So it was really special. Thanks. And I've known you for actually for, too. I should actually tell everyone, I've known Utkarsh for at least half the period of writing this book. <laughs> so he's seen me in different phases of this. So it's actually really special to be here with you. Thank you so much, Utkarsh. Yeah, thank you, Shaina. This was fun. And can't wait to do this in person with you. Have a lovely day. Absolutely. Bye. Bye. Thank you.